welcome to this series that uh, we're doing entitled Solid Foundations. This is talk six, which I've entitled Jesus, the answer to the human dilemma. To understand how Jesus is the answer to the human dilemma, you first need to know the context that led up to his coming to earth as a human being. In other words, why did Jesus leave his heavenly kingdom to come to earth? If you don't know this, then Jesus' life, death, and resurrection will make no sense at all. That's why it's crucial to understand the mega-narrative of the Bible. It starts when God creates us for a relationship with Him and a role to play for Him in this good world that He placed us. Sadly, as we know, the story was broken and tainted by the free will choices of created beings, both angelic and human. Then, right at the beginning, in Genesis 3 and verse 15, straight after this rebellion, God promised that one day, from the seed of a woman, a male child would come and rescue the story. This is the first clue that we get, right at the beginning of the story, that God had a rescue plan for the human race. It was a person. It would be a person that would be born into the world through a human seed. The Jewish nation, right throughout the Old Testament, came to know this person as the promised Messiah. The promised Messiah that would come and put the world to right again. The truth is, they were actually looking for a military king who would defeat their enemies and make Israel great again like at the time of King David or King Solomon. They completely misunderstood God's redemptive intention. Instead, the Messiah Jesus came as a suffering servant, just like Isaiah told, foretold some a thousand years before his eventual birth. You see, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures, the focus of the biblical story, the center point of the whole Bible. He appears at every one of the seven stage narratives that we've been looking at. John opens this gospel with these words about Jesus. This take us right back to the beginning in Genesis. John writes in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1 and verse 1. Jesus existed before the foundation of the world, before creation. John even tells us in John 17 and verse 5 that he spoke everything into being at creation. He was the Word. He was there at the beginning, at creation, at the very beginning. Then he's symbolically represented as the tree of life in the Garden of Eden that's rejected by Adam and Eve resulting in the fall of all humanity. We then see pictures of him in the Old Testament stories and the characters in the Old Testament scriptures like Joshua and Isaac and David and Daniel. We see him in the Old Testament prophecies that predict his future coming to earth and his death hundreds of years before it happened. The stories of his life and the birth of the church cannot be correctly understood in the context of God unless you look at it in the context of God's overall biggest story and purpose for humanity. When you understand the big story, you begin to see Jesus not just in the Gospels, but you see him right throughout the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In the big story, he existed before the beginning of, the, of life on earth, yet his life is linked to the story of Adam and Eve, who represent all of humanity. It's the reason that Jesus put aside the glory of heaven to come to earth. The Apostle Paul picks up this theme of Jesus being linked to the story of humanity in the letter that he wrote to the church at Rome. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. But even greater 
is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. You see, when you understand this story, you understand that Jesus really is the answer to the human dilemma of sin. The problem of sin and its consequences came into the world through the first human being, Adam, and it affected all humanity. Remember that we looked at sin and its consequences last session. The word for sin in the Greek is this word hamatia, which means to miss the mark. It, it's an archery term that means actually to miss the mark that the arrow was aimed at. It's, it's very specific. When we sin, we miss the glorious mark that God designed for us to achieve as his image bearers on earth. Then, because of sin, instead of reflecting God's image and God's likeness into the world like we were meant to, we end up mirroring the image of the things around us that we worship. Our behavior follows that which we worship. And when we worship things, the Bible tells us, it all ends up in death rather than the life that God intended for us. But here's the point that Paul makes in these verses. Because sin and its consequences came through the first human being, Adam, it would therefore take another human being to remove the curse of that sin from the human race. And that human being, Paul tells us, is Jesus Christ. His one act of righteousness, he says, brings a right relationship with God and new life to everyone. Paul then picks up this connection between Adam and Christ again in 1 Corinthians 15 when he writes this. The first man, Adam, became a living person. We, we understand this if we read the account of Genesis where uh, God breathed the spirit into Adam and he, it says he became a living person. The first man, Adam, became a living person. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. We looked at this verse briefly in, I think, study four, and made the point that the choice of words here is very intentional. These two names or two titles, the last Adam and the second man, that are used for Jesus are really important and significant for us to grasp. For instance, Jesus isn't called the second Adam, he's called the last Adam. He's called the last Adam because in his death, in Jesus' death, he represents the sum total of all humanity. As the last Adam, he gathers up all of the sin of humanity in his body including yours and mine, that was inherited through the first Adam. And he took it to the cross where it was dealt with by his death. As the last Adam, Jesus Christ ends the effect and consequences that the curse of sin over our life has that started with the first Adam. Then as the second man, this other title, Jesus Christ becomes the head of a new race of humanity that are liberated from the bondage of sin and death to once again fulfill the plans and purposes that God has created for us. In other words, we can now hit the mark that God designed for us to achieve as his image bearers on earth. By his resurrection, Jesus, the second man, creates the possibility for a new beginning for all of humanity. What, what Adam, the first human being, failed to do, 
Jesus Christ, the last Adam, achieved. The first Adam chose his will over God's purpose and plan for humanity. And through his one act of rebellion, Adam's one act of rebellion, humanity became separated from God and the consequences of that sin brought death to all humanity. But Jesus, the last Adam, chose his father's will over his own. And through his one act of submission, sin's power and control over us was defeated, resulting in us receiving the eternal life of God. Paul goes on to say that while Adam was a living person, Jesus Christ is a life-giving spirit. You see, when you commit your life to following Jesus, his life-giving spirit comes into you. Then you become a brand new type of person, a new race of people indwelt by the life-giving spirit of God. The second man, Jesus, creates a new kind of humanity, if you like, that is superior to the old type, the old you. If you are a child of God, you are no longer a child of Adam living under the curse of sin. You are a child of the second man, Jesus, empowered by his spirit. You are a completely different type of person, empowered with a new life source, empowered to live differently like Jesus. You are still fully human, but you're a different kind of human and that you are now spiritually alive to the world around you. You have, a, have the life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ inside of you. And because of that, you are ready to achieve your full God-given potential. So Paul would say further on in these verses, don't stay enslaved to the old you. The old Adam in you, he would say, is dead. It's been crucified on the cross. Stop living that way. You've been reborn into a new future, empowered to worship God and bring him glory by reflecting his new image in you to the world around you. Jesus didn't just come to die for our sins so that we could go to heaven when we die. Yes, he came to free us from slavery to sin and death and forgive us for our rebellion against him and turning our back on his relationship with us. And yes, when we die, we'll, be go, we'll go to be in his presence. But he actually came to free us from the slavery that we were in, to liberate us so that once again we could fully worship God and bring him glory by reflecting his new image in us into the world around us, right here, right now. God was probably more concerned about getting heaven into us than worrying about where we would go when we would die. The gospel story actually finds its context in the Jewish story of freedom from slavery in Egypt, so that they could once again be free to just freely worship God instead of being in slavery. And the Jewish Passover is the famous feast that celebrates the day when the nation of Israel has been rescued from, from death in Egypt and is rescued through the Red Sea. Then the story tells us that 50 days later at Mount Sinai, Moses is given the law. And the law is a, a sign which is a covenant of God to his people to demonstrate how they should live differently from the nations around them. Fast forward a thousand or so years and as Christians we celebrate the Passover of Christ's sacrificial death. His blood sprinkled over us saves us from death and opens a way out of slavery into a way of forgiveness and a new life. Then 50 days later after Christ's death at Pentecost we received not the law but the Spirit. Not a set of rules written on a stone, but a way of life written in our spirit. Jesus came to restore what Adam lost and regain what Satan the pretender had stolen. 
Through him, our relationship with God is restored and our vocation, our role for him on earth is fully re-established. You see, Jesus really is the solution to the larger human dilemma. Through his death and resurrection, heaven and earth are united once again. And one day, when he returns, everything, everything will be finally renewed. I look forward to catching up with you in the next session. Thank you.